guys, welcome back. It is once again as hot as the surface of the sun in the UK, so you know what I thought would be a great idea? To sit down in front of three bright white screens and record a two hour long Halo character tier list video. Yes, I am armed with 739 milliliters of ice water, and today we're going to rank all of what I consider to be Halo's major characters. Now, most of the characters are from the games. There are a few from the books from the kind of expanded universe. There are bound to be some characters on here that you think I should have put into the list that I haven't done. This is just my list of what I think are most of the major characters in the entire franchise. Uh, as always, this tier list is entirely subjective. The link to this tier list can be found in the description if you want to go and do your own. Oh, and you'll be happy to hear that in this tier list video, I've put everything together in terms of fact. So we're going to start off with UNSC, then go into Covenant, then Banish, then Forerunner, then Flood, then Endless. So should be a good one. But without any further ado, let's begin with the UNSC. And starting off with the UNSC, we have Professor Anders. Anders is going to go into A tier, I think. I enjoyed Anders as the kind of brains behind the Spirit of Fire crew. Obviously, you had Cutter that was leadership, Anders the brains, and then Forge the muscle. Um, I really like Anders. I like her sort of mini story arc in Halo Wars 1, where she gets captured by the Covenant, by Regret specifically, and then escapes. And then the more fleshing out of her character in Halo Wars 2, I really enjoyed as well. Especially the ending, where she basically gets teleported away on Installation 09. Um, we still have no idea where she is, though, which is kind of annoying. I really hope that at some point we get an update on her whereabouts, because the last we saw, she was on Installation 09 in the middle of nowhere uh, and got jumped by a Guardian. So it'd be cool to see what Anders is up to nowadays. But yeah, I enjoy Anders. She's a cool character. She's also a great leader, especially in Halo Wars 1 as well. Her cryo abilities are really good. Um, but yeah, A tier. Next up, the one and only Edward Buck. Buck is going to go firmly into S tier. Voiced by the one and only legendary Nathan Fillion, it's impossible to dislike Buck. I love his story arc in ODST and also in New Blood and Bad Blood, his transition into a Spartan, how he suffers with the rookie's death and then also Mickey's defection to the Insurrectionists. The whole like kind of character study of, of Buck going through all those traumas in those books was really, really good. Even though I'm not 100% of a fan of the direction they took Alpha 9 and killing the rookie off and Mickey becoming an insurrectionist. I do really like how Matt Forbeck characterized and wrote Buck in, in those books. And then we had Halo 5 Buck, who was good. His character wasn't as good as it was in ODST or New Blood or Bad Blood, but he still, to, at least to me, for the most part, felt like Buck. Some of his jokes that he cracked with Locke in particular, I did like. That's twice. What we're counting now? But yeah, the main thing for Buck with me is the fact that he's voiced by Nathan Fillion, who, I mean, come on, who doesn't love Nathan Fillion? He literally is Nathan Fillion's character. Uh, I, I really like Buck, and I hope that at some point, now that Alpha 9 have mostly reformed, we get another ODST game led by Buck with the rest of Alpha 9. It's like a dream. Take my advice, rookie. Never fall for a woman. Make sure she's got both. Next up, we have the leader of Noble Team, Carter, who's also going to go into A tier right now at the top of A tier. Um, out of all the Noble Team members, Carter is one of my least favorite, but I actually love Noble Team's characters, so saying least favorite is not exactly a bad thing. Uh, Carter is a great staunch leader of Noble Team, and I also just love the way that he goes out. Noble Team's deaths are so, so well done, and Carter's is just a great example of that. The captain going down with his ship is fantastic. You're on your own, Noble. Carter out. I also love how throughout Reach's story, you can tell that there's a lot weighing down on Carter's shoulders as a leader. He's leading a squad of Spartans in a war that he knows they're losing and that they're probably not going to win. And you can see that weighing down on his shoulders. I forget who voice acted Carter, but they did a fantastic job. The writing, voice acting, everything for Carter was really, really good. Top of eight here. Next up, we have... Uh... Who's that? I don't recognize that character. Hang on one second. Oh yeah, uh, Jonathan117, Mr. Master Chief, uh, the green cyborg demon himself. I mean, realistically, can Chief go anywhere that's not S plus tier? His era of characterization with like Halo 4 and some of the novels as well and Infinite and 5 as well was great for the most part. And then you've also got his era of being a mostly silent protagonist that was also excellent. Chief is a 
very dynamic character in a way because he was used, like I said, he was used very effectively as a silent protagonist in the earlier games and also very effectively as a fleshed out human character in the later games. Uh, I love his characterization in most games, even to a degree Halo 5. There are like some bright spots of his character in Halo 5 as well, but I gotta say my favorite interpretation of his character is probably Halo Infinite, honestly because at least in the era of characterization because it strikes a great balance between that silent protagonist era of a, a badass one-liner machine and then also being a more fleshed out human character i think infinite struck the, the balance between those two things perfectly um but then again going back to when he was a silent protagonist as well he was enough of a character to feel an, an attachment to but not so much of a character that you felt like he was already predefined and that you couldn't kind of put your own character onto him which i really liked i think both eras of chief have been done really well and whenever anyone asks me to pick a favorite between silent protagonist or voice chief i literally can't because i like them both but yeah he is quite obviously not just the face of the franchise not just the face of xbox but he's one of like the faces of gaming full stop like he's up there with mario and all those like easily 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 mario pikachu master chief sonic they're all on the same kind of Mount Rushmore of video game characters, right? Chief is one of the most iconic entities to ever come out of video games as a medium. And for that reason alone, he deserves S plus tier and then all the other reasons, right? I mean, after all, he's the last of his kind. He's got to be S plus tier. Oh, and also, who can forget Steve Downs' absolutely masterful performance in literally every single game and piece of media that he's played him in. Just perfection. Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this fight. Okay, so before we continue, I'm sure you've noticed by now, but this video took a long time to edit. In fact, over the past two weeks, I've spent about 12 to 15 hours literally every single day editing, which is where today's sponsor comes in, editit.tv. If you're looking at getting into YouTube, but don't want the burden of having to edit all of your own videos, then with Editit, you can hire an editor who's worked with other popular creators to help try and lighten that burden. The site features an editor leaderboard to help provide you with the best freelancers for your content, or you can choose to search for editors or thumbnail artists using the search bar for a more bespoke selection. Anybody with experience can apply as an editor for the platform as well. The login process is all done with your Google account, and editors get 100% of their income. Each editor on Editit also has their own unique URL that you can link in your description to help promote their work, and you can also rate and review editors for up to 5 stars, <laughs> just like in the good old days of YouTube, to help boost their position on the site. Editors can also boost their own position by working more consistently as well. Editit is a buy content creators for content creators platform. And for just $25 a month, you get access to unlimited orders on the site and no transaction fees whatsoever, as well as being one of the first to try out new and upcoming features. So if editing is your barrier to entry for getting into YouTube, then click the link in the description or just head on over to editit.tv and be burdened no longer. Cheers, Editit, for freeing up more of my time so I can spend it standing still in my favorite 2007 medieval point-and-click browser game. Ah, next up, we have the man, the myth, the legend, Chips Dubbo. Who's the man? I'm gonna put Chips in S tier, man. Honestly, it might seem a little bit silly because he's not really a character per se, but the amount of personality that Chips Dubbo, the Australian Marine, brought to the original trilogy is actually kind of crazy like i feel like that's one of the biggest things that modern campaigns are missing i was a bit disappointed that infinite didn't have him back quite honestly i really was hoping they were going to um chips brings so much like comedic personality to the marines as a faction him and sergeant stacker are essentially the personification of the marines in halo and they do such a good job at striking that balance between being like comedic and light-hearted and then serious and militaristic and of course chips is like the comedic and light-hearted part of that hey i'm gonna make this one into a rug he's got some unbelievably iconic voice lines uh, he's got an australian accent and i mean who doesn't love an Australian accent? Seriously, as you saw in my last tier list video, I even have my Siri set to an Australian accent, and part of that I put down to good old Chips Devo. Okay, guys, I'm gonna try and sneak up behind the flood. I'm coming in behind them now, so shush, just be quiet. I can't believe it. What the hell are these things? Crikey, look at them! 
I've never seen anything like this before. If I can just get a little bit closer, maybe I can just prod one and see what it does. I've got to be really quiet now, okay? They look pretty bloody dangerous. Oh, crikey. I've never seen things like this before. The guy is a legend. If you want to go kind of canon with him, he's pretty much survived everything. I made a video about this a few years ago. If you want to learn the kind of rough lore behind Chips Devo, you can go and watch that. But yeah, I absolutely adore Chips Devo and the Australian Marines, and I really miss them. I, I really did miss them. I, I was kind of hoping Infinite would bring him back. Next up, Cortana, who of course is just going to go, honestly, above Chief in S plus tier. Cortana is the yin to Chief's yang. She's the brains of the Chief, the Chief Cortana duo. Her story is incredible, saddening, a little bit iffy towards the end with Halo 5, but I loved how she went out finally in Infinite. Her final scene in Infinite where she detonates Zeta Halo and she's just gone after that was, to me, a mostly adequate redemption for what she did in Halo 5 and for her character kind of breaking the fourth wall a bit, her character overall. Jen Taylor's performance as Cortana is like nothing short of perfect. It's easily, easily one of the best performances in video game voice acting or voice acting full stop if you ask me. I feel like when I'm talking about Chief and Cortana, I don't really need to go into much detail as to why they're both great characters because we all just kind of know why. And even though she's the brains of the duo, Cortana also has some great one-liners as well, in particular in Halo 2. I gotta say, I think my favorite personification of Cortana was actually H2 Cortana. You look nice. Thank you. Probably Halo 2 closely followed by Halo 4. Halo 4's Cortana was fantastic, but Halo 2's, she has so many cool one-liners and little like quirky lines in that that I really, really like. I saw it too. It looked like a temple. If I were a megalomaniac, and I'm not, that's where I'd be. This light couldn't have been formed by volcanic action, which means it was either built this way on purpose or was created by some other cataclysmic event. I'm sorry. Were you trying to kill something? Halo 2 is definitely her wittiest game, but yeah, overall Cortana is just a superb character. The franchise, she, she is as much a face of the franchise as Chief is, if you ask me. Uh, she's beyond iconic. I will ask, and you will answer. Alright. Shoot. Captain's Report, February 4th, 2531. Five years. Five long years. That's how long it took us to get Harvest back. Next up, Captain James Cutter. Cutter is also going to go into A tier. Pretty much same, I'd say on par with Anders. A fantastic stoic leader of the Spirit of Fire. An incredibly decorated naval captain who fought against the Insurrection for years and then also the Covenant for years and is still out there fighting the Banish now on the Ark. Uh, the guy's a legend. He's a fantastic leader. Leads one of the coolest ships in the entire franchise, if you ask me, the Spirit of Fire. Um, but also he's got a great human side as well that was fleshed out more in Halo Wars 2 with, in particular with Isabel, I thought. And where you see one old ship I see home. And that is always worth fighting for. Ships in Halo have never been my forte, but Captain Cutter is to me one of the most iconic naval commanders in the or naval captains rather in the entire franchise, so I'd say a solid A tier. Veronica Dare, Ms. Naval Intelligence, top of A tier. I really like Dare. Uh, her character throughout ODST was fantastic. Uh, I love how close to her chest she kept all the only secrets. Like, even with Book, that whole, like, diametric played up with Book was really, really good, where even though they were kind of an item, kind of not an item, she was still very staunchly Oni and refused to tell him anything about what their real mission was. And then I love the section in Data Hive as well, where you and, you and Dare fight through the Drone Hive together. And then, like I said, in my last tier list video, I think it was, that scene where you see Virgil for the first time, where Dare introduces you to Virgil. If I'm right, this one has taken the superintendent's data and combined it with its own. Everything we want to know about the Covenant, what they're looking for under the city is right in here. Patricia Helfer's voice acting and delivery on those lines as Dare 
is some of the best voice acting in the entire franchise. I love that scene so much. And it shows that Dare is just so like mission driven above anything else. And she stays that way throughout pretty much her entire storyline in Halo so far. Throughout New Blood and Bad Blood, she's pretty much exactly the same. Of course, her and Buck are married now, um, but they're still, obviously, Buck's a Spartan 4. Dare's still working for Oni, still very much the same kinds of characters, even throughout all that. Uh, yeah, I really like Dare as a character. And she gets bonus points as well for having a recon helmet, because Halo 3's recon helmet is probably one of my, like, top three favorite Halo helmets of all time. And seeing an Oni officer wearing that helmet with like non Mjolnir armor, I think is a really cool aesthetic choice. Next up, we have Dutch. Dutch is gonna go into A tier, around the same level, maybe a tiny bit beneath Carter. Dutch is one of my least favorite members of Alpha 9, but because I love all of Alpha 9 so much, saying least favorite is <laughs> not exactly a bad thing. Immediately, Dutch gets bonus points for being named after Dutch from Predator, considering Halo has taken a lot of inspiration from both Alien and Predator in the past. This is just another example of that, and I, I really like that little sort of reference and hint. Uh, and I also love Dutch's character as well. In ODST, I love how he's like one of the gruffer members of Alpha 9, and this cutscene in particular, I always, always smile at. So, was that a yes or a no? Amen. And then his characterization throughout New Blood and Bad Blood as well, I did really like. I, I loved how his character just changed quite strongly after the rookie's death. It really shook Dutch up to the point where it basically made him retire from the military. And I can't remember what job he went to do, but he met up with Gretchen again, uh, got married to Gretchen. And I can't remember what... For some reason, I'm thinking like an ice road trucker. It wasn't an ice road trucker, but that's it was something like that that he went to do. And then, of course, he ended up joining the military again and becoming a Spartan 4. Yeah, Dutch is a great character. And like I said with Buck, I really hope we see more of Alpha 9 soon, with Gretchen included as well. Ah, next up, Emil. Now, this is going to shock some people. Maybe not. I love, love, love Emil. So, Emil is going to go S tier ever so slight on par with book not higher not lower on par with book at the top of s tier personally emil is my favorite member of noble team since the first since that spartan will rise trailer that came out before reach came out that was like a mini documentary that halsey made of all the members of noble team emil was my favorite just like that instantly straight off i this i know it's like he's typical like edgy like dark brooding character he's got a skull on his visor he loves knives his armor's black and red i don't care may i don't cut yourself emil is fantastic he's voiced by the legend jamie hector of the wire um which is a massive plus as is but i also just i just love his character how cold and, and harsh he is in halo reach in them should i push it on your knees now they're not rebels they're farmers I love his, re his response as well when George dies. It's just a very Emil response. Hey, you made it. It's a regular family reunion. Keep him. I gave him to you. I'll honor him my own way. George always said he would never leave Reach. <laughs> oh, the big man was sentimental. He gave his life thinking he'd just save the planet. We should all be so lucky considering those two were friends that had a little bit of tension at times but they were friends she needs a full psychiatric workup she's not the only one lock it down both of you his armor is uh, needless to say iconic at this point it's one of the staple armor sets of the entire halo franchise is it a bit gimmicky to, to etch a skull on your visor with your own kukri yes but is it cool as hell you can't say no. No no one can deny that it's cool as hell. It just is. I really, really like Emil. One, my, my favorite member of Noble Team, easily. One of my favorite uh, Bungie era characters, to be honest with you. Um, obviously, we can't get anything new for Emil, but I'd love some like Emil backstory. Maybe like in a, a short book or short novel or short animated short or just something like that. Because in Emil's backstory, from what I remember, um, he loses his brother, who's the last member of his family, in a glassing. And from that moment forward, that's why he just, he hates the Covenant. I mean, obviously, everyone in the UNSC hates the Covenant, but, like, Emil hates the Covenant because he lost what little was left of his family to them. Uh, and so he wants to get his own back. And that's part of why he's so violent and sadistic, which makes sense. Um, but, yeah, I, I love Emil. Emil's so cool, man. I love Emil. Next up, we have John Forge, my favorite member of the Spirit of Fire crew, going at the top there. 
I love John Forge, honestly. Um, his story in Halo Wars, his ending was very sad. He went out a hero, saving the spirit of fire. However, the guy single-handedly brought down an Arbiter, and not just any Arbiter, Ripper Moromi. An Arbiter that had to be freed from prison for being so savage. This wasn't just your average Arbiter. This guy was a literal savage. And Forge took him down on his own in what was mostly hand-to-hand -hand combat, may I add, which is fantastic. And for the record, I would have kicked your ass the first time if the lady hadn't stopped me. He's got great charisma. I love the scenes where he both saves Anders and also where he tries and fails to save her. He's just an all-round really fun character. That scene at the start of Halo Wars 2 is always quite sad when I think it's Cutter goes up and just looks at his cryo bay with it being empty. Very sad. I miss Forge, but uh, it's cool at least that his daughter's out there, Ryan Forge. She's out there doing quite literally galaxy-changing stuff. I mean, because of her, Guilty Spark has now gone to reseed the precursors, which... <laughs> Which is wild to think about. I've never actually put that into a sentence before and just thought about it. Because of Ryan Forge, Guilty Spark has gone with the librarian to reseed the precursors in a different galaxy. <laughs> that was crazy. To say that Forge has left a legacy is uh, quite the understatement. Next up, we have Fred, my tied favorite member of Blue Team. Fred's gonna go in S tier, uh, just below Buck. I love Fred. The knife master of Blue Team is just such a cool trait to have as a character. And so many of the things that he's done in the Expanded Universe with his knives are just so, so sick. Which is why in Halo 5, I was so disappointed that Blue Team's characters were just so neutered and didn't really feel like their Buck counterparts at all. Like, I was really excited to see Buck do some crazy shit with knives, like he does in the package, for example, in that Halo Legends short. When the, he, he backs up against that door, there's like a whole army of Covenant coming towards him, and he gets his knives out. It's just such a sick scene, and we didn't really get any of that in Halo 5, which uh, really sucked. There's also one thing that I love about him that we've finally seen come to reality. This piece of concept art for Fred for Halo 5 was one of the best pieces of, of spot and concept art in Halo full stop. And now that we've got the Morrigan helmet in Halo Infinite, we've kind of seen that come to a reality. We just need ponchos and massive knives now. They're the, the next two things we need to be able to fully cosplay that version of Fred. But yeah, I love Fred, the stoic leader of Blue Team alongside Chief, um, with a fantastic personality, uh, very cool, unique traits. Fred is my tied favorite member of Blue Team. You'll see who he's tied with in a minute. Dr. Catherine Horsey. I feel like Horsey has to go in S plus tier. She is the backbone of everything in Halo, pretty much. She's the personification of the gray area. Like, she is the personification of the philosophical debate of whether the ends justify the means. Because on the one hand, she committed one of the worst war crimes in the history of humanity, kidnapping and stealing children at the age of six to forcibly conscript them into the military, pump them full of experimental chemicals, and then force them to become essentially cyborgs. I mean, it's very hard to think of anything less moral and ethical than that. However, on the same note, if she hadn't done that, then the Spartans would have never, would have never been created, and in turn, the Covenant would have just walked all over humanity. Like, she, in doing what she did, which was horrific, she also saved billions upon billions upon billions of human lives so you gotta kind of weigh it up at the same time though you gotta remember that when she made the spartans she wasn't doing it to fight the covenant she was doing it to stomp down the insurrection it just so happened that the covenant turned up like 10 11 years later and the spartans just happened to be really good at stopping them so she never created the spartans with the intention of saving humanity from the alien force that doomed their extinction she did it to stomp down rebellions, which just adds to the morally gray area element of her character. Over her time in the Halo universe, there have been elements of a story that have really like fluffed her up and made her seem like this hero of humanity. There have been other eras of the story that have done the complete opposite and have tried to demonize her relentlessly. And honestly, both are correct because like I said, she did horrific things, but in doing those horrific things, she saved humanity. So you gotta kind of weigh them up. Yeah, Halsey is a fantastic, she is the epitome of a great area character and just has to go in S plus tier. Next up, we have Jerome, and Jerome's gonna go, I'd say, 
on, honestly on par with Cutter and Anders. Um, Jerome is essentially like the Bungie era Master Chief of Red Team and the Spirit of Fire crew, especially in Halo Wars 2. He kind of became that silent protagonist sort of character that just spits out one-liners and does cool things, and I really like that. Of course, his Mark IV armor is beyond iconic at this point. Mark IV is a beautiful, beautiful set of armor. And I love that Jerome and Red Team still wear it. I do hope at some point in the future we get more Jerome because there's a lot of potential there, I think, with his character. And also with the rest of Red Team as well. I don't think they're really as fleshed out as they could be. Next up, the man, the myth, the legend, Sergeant Avery Johnson. I mean, I'm going to put him just... Uh, yeah. On par with Cortana. Maybe a slight bit higher. I mean, like I said for Cortana and Chief, I don't need to go into detail as to why Johnson is one of Halo's best characters. He is a badass, badass soldier who was once a Spartan 1 slash Orion candidate and is one of the few long-term survivors of the Orion project. So if it weren't for Johnson, then Chief would have never really happened. David Scully's performance as Johnson is nothing short of iconic. Usually the good Lord works in mysterious ways, but not today. This here is 66 tons of straight up H Eastview and divine intervention. If God is love, then you can call me Cupid. One of the most iconic performances in the entire franchise. So much so that we haven't had any like properly new Johnson stuff in the games since 2007. He never gets me anything. Oh, I know what the ladies like. And people still talk about Johnson as if he's the main character of the entire franchise still around today. He has left such a lasting impact in the franchise. It blows my mind that 343 haven't done something with him. Like, where's the Sergeant Johnson AI in Halo Infinite or something, you know? Like, there's got to be something done with Johnson. When we meet the enemy, we will rip their skulls from their spines and toss them away laughing. Am I right, Marines? Sir, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Damn right I am. Now move it out. Double time! I've looked at David Scully's work recently, and it, I don't know if he like retired from voice acting or something, but he's not done much in a long time, and I'd, I'd love, I don't know, I'd just love to see him come back as Jonathan at some point. I think he was going to for Halo Wars 2, but because of like scheduling conflicts or something, or some other reason, he couldn't come back as Jonathan. But man, I, Jonathan is just the charisma. How you doing? <laughs> the personality, the balls of pretty much the entire UNSC. This man is the personification of that. He has so many badass one-liners, badass moments, heroic moments. He goes out an absolute hero, making sure that Spark goes down. Just an incredibly, one of the best Halo characters of all time. One of my top three, four favorite characters of all time and one that I miss so dearly. Oh, real quick, whilst we're on the topic of Jonathan, I just want to give a massive shout out to the story Breaking Quarantine from the Halo graphic novel, which tells of how Jonathan survives the, the ambush by the flood in 343 Guilty Spark. This graphic novel portrays how he was the only survivor of that event so damn well. It has such a sick Japanese aesthetic to it that I absolutely love. Very underrated Jonathan story, but overall, like I said, Jonathan is just a near perfect character and I miss him so much. I want more Jonathan played by David Scully. Thank you. Next up, we have George, one of the three members of Noble Team that I'm going to put into S tier, below Emil. George was the BFG, the big friendly giant of Noble Team. He was the biggest Spartan. He was the only Spartan 2 in Noble Team, which is partly why he met his unfortunate end when he did. Um, he's fantastic. Of course, I've got to give credit because he's a British Spartan, right? Well, he's not British, but he's got a British accent. I've got to give him credit for that. But I love the more empathetical moments of George's character. When he speaks to civilians in Hungarian or talks that girl down from being scared from the, the zealots in Hungarian as well. I love the little moments of humanization like that. They really Really helped George stand out above the rest. Your accent sounds familiar. Chaperon? Tangari. Friend of yours? Father. Shine along. I'm sorry. Why would you be? Big man forgets what he is sometimes. She just lost her father. I think if you were to like take an average ranking of every member of Noble Team across like every person that played Reach, George would probably rank the highest. But for me, he's the second highest because Emil is just untoppable for me. I just, I love Emil too much, but I, I love George's character so much. His end, like I said, very sad, very unfortunate. Listen, Reach has been good to me. Time has come to return the favor. Don't deny me this. 
the first shock of Reach seeing him actually die because obviously Spartan must never die, right? But then only like five missions in, we see one of the main characters, a Spartan, die. But yeah, fantastic humanization of the Spartans, fantastic voice work by, I forget the guy's name who voiced him, but fantastic voice work. If by some insane stretch of the imagination, we ever get George in a live action thing, <laughs> this is going to sound really obscure, but I'd love to see Timothy Dalton play him. For some reason, George has always reminded me of Timothy Dalton. I think Timothy Dalton would play a fantastic George, but yeah, I love George. Second favorite member of Noble Team. No, he's not. He's my third favorite member of Noble Team because my second favorite is June A266, the last surviving member of Noble Team. I love how kind of quiet and reserved June is. You just get this sense of like, I don't know what the word is, maybe like elitism or something from June. He knows that he's one of the best at what he does. Here, you may need these. High velocity armor piercing. They'll take the hat off an elite at 2,000 yards. And they ain't cheap. He's one of the most talented snipers in the entire UNSC. He knows it. He's got such a fantastic voice actor as well. Whole area is supposed to be evacuated. Didn't like leaving it to someone else to protect our home. So we came back. For this. We have them hidden all over the territory. You know, this stuff is stolen. What, you gonna arrest me? No. I'm gonna steal it back. And I love the fact that he actually survives Reach and goes on to become a, a recruiter for Oni for the Spartan 4 project, which I think is very fit for his character. He does look quite a lot like um, Agent whatever his name is from Hitman now, now for some reason. But there's a very small part of me that hopes at some point in the future, we might see June put his armor back on and become a fighting Spartan again and get a story or something with him in it. Uh, there was a very little part of me that was hoping in Halo Infinite we were going to see June because obviously there's quite a lot of references to Noble Team in that game and Reach in general and June is still very present. I mean, granted, he is technically in the game in some of the season two lore text file things. June is in them, so he's still very present in the story, um, as present as he's been since Reach, in fact. But I really want to see him put the armor on again and, and fight again. I'd love to see June and Chief back-to-back -back fighting. That'd be fantastic. Um, also, another very underrated bit of June's character, although it's technically not canon, it's as close to, some, to being canon as something can be without being fully canon. A Fistful of Arrows, the story that tells of how he escaped Reach on his own and saved Horsey, is just absolutely fantastic. Leviathan did a great job on that. If you haven't read it, then I'd highly recommend it. Uh, but yeah, I love June's character so much. Just that sense of elitism about his character. He knows that he's one of the best marksmen in the entire military, and he's not afraid to show it off. Next up, we have Kat, who is my probably fourth favorite member of Noble Team, I'd say, maybe fourth. Uh, she's gonna go above Carter in A tier. I like Kat, I like how kind of cocky Kat is. A good place to look might be, I don't know, the nearest non-existent launch site in the non-existent Sabre program dismissed by three administrations as preposterous rumor, and in which our newest member was certainly never a pilot. It's scary, you know that. It's the same kind of thing with, with June, where June is like kind of elitist in a way. I don't know if that's the right word, something like that. But like you can you can tell with June, he knows how good of a sniper he is. With Kat, you can tell that she knows how intelligent she is and she's not afraid to not show off, but she's not afraid to be confident with that, which I think is very, very cool. You're in my light, Commander. Of course, her death is probably on par with George in being the most iconic of Noble Team's deaths. Just, they're just a random needle shard was so unexpected. There was no foreshadowing or anything for it. Of course, there is the fact that the brains of Noble Team get shot in the brain. That's like the whole ironic thing of Noble Team, um, which I really liked. But yeah, I, I like Kat's character quite a lot, uh, but she's tied fourth, I'd say. Next up, we have Kelly, my, again, least favorite member of Blue Team, but Blue Team is so sick, she's still going S tier. Um, I really like Kelly, of course, a British Spartan. She wins a point for that from me. The fastest Spartan to ever exist. I believe it, I think it's in Fall of Reach. There's a bit where during training, she gets up to like 90 kilometers an hour sprinting or something, which is frankly ridiculous. It was something in that ballpark, which is a very cool trait for a character who's wearing one ton power armor. <laughs> yeah, I really, really like Kelly, but out of all the members of Blue Team, she's the one that I love the slight bit least. Captain Jacob Keyes is also going to go into S tier around, I'd say just been... Mm. Decisions, decisions. 
About there, actually, you know what? I'm bumping my ranking up a bit better than George. I really, really, really like keys. I actually re-listened to the Cold Protocol for the first time in quite a long time recently, and it reminded me of how much I love keys more than just Halo 1 did. All of the stuff that he does in the Cold Protocol, leading the Midsummer Night and getting involved with the insurrection in that book was really good. And then, of course, his leadership of the Pillar of Autumn uh, in Halo 1, and also to a degree Reach as well, was really good. Hearing the Pete Stacker playing keys again in Infinite, the first time I saw that cutscene, when he's talking, it's a flashback where he's talking to Halsey, was like, I was like, what the, f that's not Pete Stacker. And it was Pete Stacker, and I was very, very happy. But you made an AI of yourself, Catherine. Yourself. Is there a better candidate? Keys is one of, for me at least, one of the most iconic and most Halo characters. And out of all the characters in the entire franchise, he probably met the most grisly end out of all of them. Becoming the basis of a proto grave mind and having the flood sift through all of his thoughts and memories and twisting and contorting them and trying to use them to its advantage is just a horrific way to go out. Next up, we have Kurt, who is also a god tier Spartan 2. I'm gonna put Kurt beneath uh, all the members of Blue Team. I love Kurt. To me, Kurt was always kind of like the alpha Spartan 2, the best of like all of the Spartan 2s. To me, he was always like that. His death was so heroic and just so badass. Going down, like taking out so many Covenant with him by blowing up a bomb on him, which is so, so sick. I love his death, even though it's kind of sad. Of course, he was involved in the Spartan 3 program as well. Um, he was one of the early members of that. He was also one of the first people that we saw wearing the beautiful SPI armor as well, which he gets a bonus point for from me for sure. Next up, Captain Lasky, the leader of the Infinity. Lasky is going to go again into S tier. I would say above blue team, but below Key's Nibble team and Buck. I love, love, love Lasky. Lasky is easily my favorite new 343 era character. Like, I'd say by quite a long shot, to be honest with you. Copy, Cortana. Weapons. Prepare fire explosion. We promised to get the chief inside that ship, and I'm not about to let that man down. Lasky is a fantastic leader. He has many of the same traits as Keys, but he's obviously noticeably younger and less experienced. Not so much now, but when he was introduced in Halo 4, he was a lot less experienced than Keyes was in Halo 1, and yet still he's able to act as that really crucial humanizing anger for Chief, especially towards the end after Chief lost Cortana. That final cutscene on the bridge of the Infinity with Chief and Lasky is fantastic. It just sucks that in Halo 5 his character was toned down quite a bit and that he's not been present at all in Infinite or any of Infinite stuff. Like, it kind of frustrates me that we still don't know much about what Lasky's doing on Zeta Halo. Well, not much. We know next to nothing about that. The only slight downside to Lasky's character for me is Ford Unto Dawn, the story. I didn't really enjoy Ford Unto Dawn as much as other people did. Um, his characterization in it was decent, I guess, but I'm just not a massive fan of that, so it doesn't resonate much with me. But in particular, Halo 4's version of Lasky is just fantastic, and I really hope at some point soon in Infinite we get the return of Lasky. I, I've seen people talking about this and I love it. I want Punish Lasky. I want Lasky with a beard, like an eye patch, and have him wielding a shotgun like he did in that one spot in that cutscene where he saves Horsey from the Knights when they invade the Infinity. That's such a sick cutscene. And I'd love to see Lasky become more like that now that he's been grizzled by the war on his Eater Halo. Next up, we have Linda, my tied favorite member of Blue Team. I'm going to put she's on par with with fred honestly she's my tied favorite there's that one scene i can never remember if it's in first strike or the fall of reach it's one of the two where she hangs upside down on a cable in space and angles her herself at such an angle that the light from the sun reflects off her at such an angle that it makes her invisible and snipes banshee pilots out of their banshees whilst hanging upside down on the cable and reflecting light off herself to become invisible I mean, she is the best marksman in the entirety of the UNSC that there probably ever will be. She's got such a cool demeanor as well. One thing that I did really like in Halo 5 is how protective she is of Chief. That one scene towards the end where she steps in front of Chief like really subtly to try and protect him from Cortana is really, really cool. Shows the kind of inner workings of Blue Team much better than most of that game did. She's also, I think, been through the most physical pain of all the members of Blue Team as well. I mean, after the fall of Reach, she was, I think she was actually pronounced dead. She was basically dead. They put her in a cryotube on the Pillar of Autumn, and when the Covenant invaded it, they shot her out into space so the Covenant couldn't get their hands on her. She was basically dead after the, after the fall of Reach, and yet now she's perfectly fine doing what she does best, even better than ever before. 
fantastic character. Now that all the members of Blue Team are done, I really, really hope we get more Blue Team soon. I need to know what they've been up to after Halo 5. I'd love Blue Team DLC for Infinite would be so sick. I want to play as all the members of Blue Team, but have them be more unique than they were in Halo 5. Have Fred be like really knife focused. Have Linda be really sniper focused. Have Kelly be lightning fast. Just something like that would be sick. Right then, next up we have Spartan Locke. I'm going to put Locke at the bottom of B tier. There's obviously <laughs> nothing else in B tier yet, but he'll be at the bottom of B tier here. Locke's character for me really frustrates me because the potential, the like, the kind of backbone of the character is so, so sick. The fact that he's this like shady only operative who was sent to hunt down Chief, like that's such a cool backstory. But then his execution in both Nightfall and Halo 5 was just not good. Not at all. Um, I really want Locke to be done justice though. I really do. There was that concept art that I think it was Garrett Post made a few months ago of punish Locke after losing the fight with Hyperius on his Zeta Halo. He has to like survive behind enemy lines for ages and scavenge weapons and gear. And it looks so, so sick. I would love to see a Locke DLC like that. Um, I do want to see Locke's character done justice, even though he's not been great so far. Like I said, the, the backbone of the character is like sick as hell it's like one of my dream characters and i'd love to see i'd love to see him given another shot and really have them nail his character this time because there's so much potential there oh his gen 2 hunter armor by the way as well is one of the few sets of gen 2 armor that i really really like it's one of the few gen 2 sets that i can honestly say i probably love i think hunter looks really cool next up lord terence hood i'm gonna put lord hood in a tier around near the top next just beneath there i think i always thought it's kind of cool how lord hood was literally a lord he's like either a descendant of british royalty or like he was a member of british royalty it's one of the two obviously a legendary admiral in his own right he played a massive part in defending earth and the covenant's first invasion of it during halo 2 and now he's on a shield world i believe drinking his sorrows away i'm pretty sure the last story that we got with lord hood in was rossback's world where him and i think it was him and serin osman are basically escorted off earth when the created uprising starts and taken to a shield world i think it was called rossback's world and they're basically taken there to, to protect them and hide them from the created and lord hood just kind of drinks his sorrows away which is a little bit depressing. I'd love to see a more updated version of her to see what he's up to now. It, honestly, I'd love Lord Hood to come back in a, like a main character fashion like he did in Halo 2 and Halo 3. Him and Lasky working together would be fantastic. But yeah, I, I do like Lord Hood's character a lot. He's just not been fleshed out enough yet, I don't think. Oh, one other thing as well. Lord Hood gets bonus points because he's played by the one and only legend Ron Perlman. But for more reasons than just that, right? So when Halo 2 came out in 2004, obviously I was absolutely obsessed with Halo 2 and everything in that game right from day one. However, at the same kind of time, Ron Perlman's Hellboy movies released where he played Hellboy. And in those movies, there's a character called Abe who always back in the day when I was younger reminded me of a Halo 2 Elite. And I loved Abe because he reminded me of the Elites. And in turn, that made me love Ron Perlman's Hellboy even more. It's a strange link there, but I just had to mention it in this section because I just remember loving those two kind of simultaneously because <laughs> Abe looked like an Elite. Next up, we have Marcus Stacker, who's just going to go slightly below Chips Debo in S tier, which again, like I said before, Chips Debo seems weird, but Marcus Stacker to me is like Chips Debo, is one of the main personifications of the Marine as kind of like a meta character themselves. He's the kind of militaristic and serious side of it, the gung ho side of it, if you will. I love him. Uh, I loved how in Halo 1, all the Marcus Stacker characters, the reason he's called Marcus Stacker, I assume, is because his face is Marcus Leto's face. You'll notice that on all of his Marines. I do not believe it! But yeah, just like Chips Dobo, hearing his voice in the battlefield is always quite reassuring in a way. And I did love his small cameo in Halo 4. I think it's on Reclaimer towards the end of that in the Scorpion section. When you first teleport back out to the kind of desert area, Marcus Stacker is there leading the force, which is very, very cool. I'd love to see him and Chips Dubbo come back as recurring marine voice actors because they are just like so important for, for personifying the, the marines as a whole. And I feel like Halo is missing quite a lot without them. Oh, next up we have the loyal ODST turned traitor turned partially loyal ODST, 
Mickey Crespo. Mickey is probably, I would say, the best character of Alpha 9 besides Buck. I'm going to put Mickey top of A tier. Uh, just on, on par with Dare, I'd say. He's equal to Dare with me. I really, really do like Mickey. Um, his defection to an insurrectionist was... I wasn't sure how to think about it for quite a while, but as I've gone back over the details of New Blood and of Bad Blood, and I've reread the sections where he starts to turn again, because obviously it's not just like a snap thing, it's a slow degradation into becoming an insurrectionist. I do kind of like it. Um, I think the fact that he's become a, a member of Alpha 9 again so quickly after Rookie's death, considering the insurrectionists were to blame for that, is a little bit weird. Um, I don't know if that's as realistic in terms of characterization with Buck and everyone as I would have thought, but uh, I do really like his slow descent into an insurrectionist. The fact that there's that guy uh, in the Spartan 4 training facility, I forgot his name, who was like slowly like trickling information to him about the insurrection, like trying to coax him over and then he finally breaks and gets him. So yeah, his slow descent into the insurrection was pretty good, along with his like jailbreak scene in Bad Blood. I love that where Buck has to go onto Laconia Station and had to basically jailbreak Mickey out. I really love that scene with Leonidas slowly turning to the created in the background. That was a really, really real well written scene in Bad Blood that I enjoyed and getting Mickey out and seeing how the rest of Alpha 9 reacted to being reunited with Mickey again was was interesting um yeah i like i said with the rest of alpha 9 i'd love to see an alpha alpha 9 reunion game or story at some point well, i guess story bad blood was kind of like that right but i'd love to see like a game that that where you play as them as spartan force again i think that'd be really sick but yeah mickey i his slow descent to the insurrection i thought was handled pretty well it was also interesting seeing a squad torn apart like that after all that they'd gone through together and then also be like pieced back together bit by bit as well after being torn apart it's quite interesting uh so yeah mickey's going towards the top of eight here just below there. Next up, Miranda Keys. Uh, Miranda's gonna go B tier. Uh, about there, I'd say. She's, I like Halo 2 Miranda uh, quite a lot. Halo 3 Miranda's alright, um, but I don't think she's ever really been that fantastic of a character, really. Uh, she's the child of Halsey and Keys. Like, she's obviously a fantastic like, in-universe character, but I don't think she was ever written to her true potential. She was, I think, the youngest commander in UNSC Navy history, which is pretty cool. But that's never really touched on in the games. Um, in Halo 2, she's a lot more personified than Halo 3. Her death was, like, quite sad, I'd say, but not super, super sad. Not, like, Jonathan levels by any means. Uh, but she did go out a hero. She go out... Well, I say that. She kind of did. She should have, technically, even though I didn't want her to, she should have shot Jonathan. Because in refusing to pull the trigger, she allowed Truth to activate the entire Halo array. Like, for not pulling the trigger, she almost just killed everything, which was a pretty bad move. But yeah, Miranda Keys wasn't really fleshed out that much in the original trilogy. She could have been fleshed out a lot more. Had Halo 3's writing been more like Halo 2's and less like Halo 1's, maybe she should she would have been. But for now, I think B tier is a good ranking. Where should they go? To war. Noble Six. Can't really rank Noble Six that much, but I'm going to put him in... I'd, I'll just stick him in B tier, I think, uh, because I like the kind of shady, only lone wolf backstory that he's got. That's pretty cool backstory. The fact that he was able to make entire militias disappear was very, very cool. Although none of that really matters because the whole point of his character, like the rookie, is that he is you. Um, except this time he has a few voice lines, like the rookie that didn't have a single one. Palmer. Um, I don't dislike Palmer, but at the same time, I also don't love Palmer. I think top of B tier for Palmer is probably a good place. Uh, I like the fact that she used to be in an ODST, and it's undoubtable that she's done some really badass stuff. I just find her character to be a bit too cocky and brash at times. But then again, she's done some really cool stuff. Like, there's that one scene when she shoots Horsey in Spartan Arms. <laughs> this sounds so specific, but she does this really cool thing where she kind of, like, she leans over with a dual magnums and fires, like, through a Promethean at Horsey. I always thought that shot was kind of cool. <laughs> I do think people sometimes get too hung up on that I thought you'd be taller thing and just hate her for that alone, which I don't think is necessary at all. Um, but at the same time, I don't love Palmer either. She's she's good. She's, Palmer's a good character. She's a cool Spartan 4 commando. I love her armor, by the way. Scout is like any Scout helmet, even like Gen 2 Scout for me. I immediately love, so the fact that she wears Scout is a massive dub for me. 
But yeah, B tier, I think, is a good place to Palmer. The pilot, Fernando Esparza. I'm going to put pilot uh, in A tier, at the bottom of A tier. We don't really know much about him so far, to be honest with you, besides the fact that he hid from the Banish on the Infinity and then tried to hide again in space. Uh, his intro cutscene, of course, is pretty sad. I always remember everyone like really liking his intro cutscene when they first revealed it at E3. Uh, and also the way it was handled in-game was really good as well. Chief, it, it, he was basically used as a vessel for Chief to impart his hope and optimism onto, and obviously it worked. I love the final cutscene of Infinite as well with him, like just looking so happy and ready to fight again. We finished the fight. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, it's a very, very good turnaround in his character when he's lost all hope in the middle. He, he regains his hope when he finds Chief, and then he loses it all in the middle, and then he regains it again, which I liked. It was a very good, like, beginning, middle, and end point for a story. But I would like to see more fleshing out of the pilot in future stories. Uh, the highest I can rank him is bottom of A tier right now because he's a very much surface level character, I think. But he played a very good part in Infinite, and I like him a lot. Next up, we have Preston Cole, arguably the greatest commander in human naval history, maybe even human military history. I can't put Cole any lower than S tier, to be quite honest with you, for his feats. Like, I'm, like I said before, with keys, I'm by no means a massive ship guy. I don't love ships and all their designations and stuff. That's never really been an area of interest in Halo for me. But despite that, I can appreciate how legendary Cole is. Um, I mean, firstly, defining the Cole protocol is a massive deal. The fact that he defines something that probably saved the species on countless occasions throughout the war, and that in the first cutscene of Infinite Season 2 story was uh, completely violated, um, <laughs> bringing Eratus back to that base was a complete violation of the Cole Protocol, like a cut and dry violation of it. Um, but the fact that he created something that saved humanity countless times is very, very good. The impossible life and possible death of Preston J. Cole is a fantastic mini story in Halo Evolutions. Uh, yeah, I think Cole's a fantastic character. He's won, I don't know how many battles against overwhelming odds. Um, one of the greatest military strategists in human history. He's got to go in S tier. He just, he just has to. Next up, Roland. Roland is going to go into, I'd say, A tier just below the Spirit of Fire crew. So, there. I really like Roland, um, especially the visual design of him. Having him be a, his avatar be a World War One fighter pilot is really cool. I also liked his characterization, funnily enough, in Halo 5, where he basically took like a middle ground between the Infinity crew uh, and Chief when it came to how to deal with Cortana and the fact that she was in the domain now. You're out of line, Roland. Yes, sir, but so is everyone else. You created Cortana, Doc. And now you're throwing her out the airlock with these accusations. Roland. You think she tricked the Master Chief into abandoning his post? Respectfully, sir, to what end? Why is Cortana the problem? Because she refused to die when she was supposed to? I really like that middle ground that he took because you could tell that he was like, yeah, this is very dangerous. However, the fact that you're treating an AI like just a piece of tech and not like a human, even though she's a smart AI, I love that middle ground to try and humanize the AIs, which is obviously one of the main backbones of Halo 5's story. Did it execute that backbone right? Probably not, but it's a cool idea. And I think Roland's character and personality was written really well in that moment. I do hope that when Lasky left the Infinity, he actually took Roland with him, because Roland was one of the few AIs that didn't join the Created, which is also another plus for his character as well. It makes him seem more unique and stand out compared to the other AIs, which I, I really like. Yeah, I, I sure hope that Lasky remembered to pull his chip out and took him with him and <laughs> didn't just leave him on the Infinity. If he did, then maybe at some point we'll have to go rescue him from the Infinity. That'd be kind of a cool mission, actually. But yeah, I, I do like Roland a lot. Next up, we have Romeo, my tied favorite member of Alpha 9, besides Buck, of course. Gonna go up here on par with Mickey. I love that scene where Buck gives him a sniper rifle and he's like, what the hell am I gonna do with this in a Covenant ship? What the hell am I supposed to do with this inside a Covenant ship? If only you knew, Romeo. If only you knew. It gets up to some cool stuff with Dutch in the Expanded Universe in that comic. Um... Helljumpers, that's what it's called. Uh, he gets up to some cool stuff on that uh, that colony world where they have to fight the Covenant. Uh, yeah, Romeo's characterization, I, I like a lot. And finally, for Alpha 9, we have the Rookie. <sighs> Wake up, Buttercup. Who really isn't a character. Uh, I don't really know how to rank him, to be honest with you. I guess I'll just put him bottom of A tier, maybe? Because uh, 
Rookie was literally a silent protagonist, which is why I wasn't a massive fan with them naming him recently. They give him a name. I think it's like, is it John Doherty, I think? Um, it's like naming Noble Six. You shouldn't do that, I don't think, because the whole point of that character was for you to impart your character onto them. Uh, but the Rookie was like the pure definition of a silent protagonist. That said, though, he does convey some character in mannerisms, and I love so many of his little mannerisms in ODST. I can't name any specifically. I'll have some on screen right now, obviously, but there's a little, like, shrugs and stuff that he does, and the way that he, <laughs> the way that he manages to go through the entirety of the events of ODST without speaking a word is quite good, honestly. That's quite a feat. Holly Tanaka, um, C tier. She's all right. I like her armor. She, her armor's decent, but her character's just, like, kind of all right, I guess. Uh, her best story was that one in Halo Escalation, where she survived in that colony uh, against the, uh, the Covenant for ages and like led the entire group of survivors. I liked that, um, but in Halo 5, she was kind of meh, probably my least favorite member of uh, Osiris, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, she was all right. Olympia Vale. Vale is going to go with the top of B tier for me. Uh, I love the kind of connections to the elites with her. She didn't say Ray Martin. She didn't say, Wu Te Hade. What's that, Vale? Sangili burial prayer. A warrior at birth, a warrior in death. I wish that had been used a bit more in Halo 5. Um, the few moments where it was used were cool, like when she starts speaking Sangheili, uh, when she finds all those dead elite bodies and stuff like that. I like that little, little interaction. But I just kind of wish we'd have more of that. I f again, just like Tanaka, my favorite version of Vale's character wasn't in her debut game, rather in her debut story in Hunters in the Dark. Hunters in the Dark is, for me, probably the most underrated Halo story of all time, or Halo book of all time. And Vale's really good in that before she became a Spartan. Um, but she's a lot more characterized in that than I think she was in Halo 5. Next up, we have the weapon, who I'm going to put towards the top of A tier, right at the top. It's a very simple version of Cortana, kind of a different version of Cortana, but a very simplified version of that character, pretty much. I like her kind of naiveness towards everything. It's kind of cool seeing Chief teaching her stuff as they go along, when in most cases it's the opposite way around. Cortana's the one teaching Chief stuff, so it's nice seeing those roles flipped. And Jen Taylor's voice acting as her in Infinite was absolutely fantastic. The fact that Jen Taylor managed to voice three characters in Halo Infinite and all have them sound completely different, but also at times similar when they needed to be, just shows how goddamn incredible of a voice actress she is. Um, and the way, like I said, the weapon was a great example of that. I love her naiveness in Halo, in Halo Infinite and just how oblivious she was to certain things, how simple she was at times, but then also the bit where uh, she almost gets deleted by Chief. That section, I think it's in the Command Spire, where she basically falls out with Chief in a way. That was a very interesting dynamic to take into a level and have play out throughout the level, which I really enjoyed. And he was going to delete me. What? Chief? Really? He doesn't talk much. He's more of what you might call a man of action. Especially when it comes to killing things. Right, Chief? But yeah, I can't really rank her any higher than that because she's a very new character and we've not had much of it yet in the universe. But maybe in the future when we get more stories of Chief and the weapon and of course the pilot as well, they'll both go up in the rankings. Right, finally, onto the Covenant characters. I'll be honest, I was getting a bit tired of talking about UNSC characters there. Onto the Covenant characters, we start off with <laughs> the single best character in not just the entire franchise, but video games full stop. The Arbiter, S plus tier. The Arbiter is the best Halo character of all time for me. If you were to ask me who the kind of main characterized character, if you get me, is of the Halo franchise, I would say the Arbiter. What would you have your Arbiter do? Um, obviously Chief is a character, but he's more of a silent protagonist overall, whereas the Arbiter is a fully fleshed out character from the get-go. And I mean, Halo 2's story is the Arbiter story. Joe Staten has said as much so many times now. It's his story, and that is why Halo 2's story is the best video game story of all time. That makes two of us. The fact that the same elite who was responsible for glassing Reach and following you to Alpha Halo and almost killing you, then becomes a disgraced warrior and has to regain his honor but can never do it and in doing so realizes that his entire religion is a lie and then further realizes that one of the species in his religion wants to exterminate his species and so defects to the other side. Just the Arbiter's plotline 
in Halo 2 and Halo 3 is absolutely masterful. The best written character in the whole franchise. Keith David is an absolute legend. I went to go see Bullet Train a few days ago and there was a commercial for Jordan Peele's new movie Nope in it. And that commercial is Keith David. And immediately I was like, it's Keith David, the officer. It's just so cool seeing it. Every time I see Keith, Keith David in a movie or like anything, I'm always like, oh man, it's the Arbiter. Uh, Fun, absolutely just perfect, perfect performance by him for The Arbiter. Joe Staten is writing for The Arbiter is just perfect. My dream, my absolute dream, now that Joe is back with Halo, is for us to get a spin-off game or a DLC for Infinite or something, where The Arbiter comes back and it's an Arbiter-focused, Arbiter protagonist story slash DLC, whatever, written by Joe Staten in like a Halo 2 style. That would be my dream. I want more Arbiter. But yeah, his, his character, the arc that he goes through in Halo 2 and Halo 3, also with the stuff from like the Fall of Reach and also Halo 1 in the background, is just masterful. Absolutely masterful. Not just my favorite Halo character of all time, but the best Halo character of all time, full stop. Next up, a character very much linked to the Arbiter, the heretic leader, Cesar Raphame. Cesar is going to go right at the top of S tier. He is a massively, massively underrated character, if you ask me. The extra backstory that we got for him in the Halo 2 Anniversary Terminals was really cool, seeing how he was left behind on the gas mine at Alpha Halo, and how he met Spark, and how he became a heretic. I love that, seeing all the, the lies of the, the Covenant being put out in front of him, laid out, and just systematically destroyed by, by spark was very very cool seeing his slow transition into a heretic was was very good very very good massive props as well to miguel ferreira the unfortunately late miguel ferreira for his portrayal of the heretic leader as well just incredible voice acting i said this in my last tier list video but this little bit of dialogue here i wondered who the prophets would send to silence me an arbiter i'm flattered he's using a hollow drone he must be close Come out so we may kill you. <laughs> Get in line. It's absolutely fantastic. That last bit there. <laughs> Get in line. Every time. Every time that sends chills down my spine. The role the heretic leader plays in Halo 2's story as well is just perfect. The fact that Felverdam's first adversary as an arbiter is someone who he would later look back on and regret killing and i believe in the encyclopedia that came out recently the arbiter it even says the arbiter like named a ship or a colony or something after cesar Raphame, which is very very cool but the fact that his first adversary was someone that he would later find a lot of common ground with i thought was very intelligent as well i just wish cesar had never shot first if he hadn't shot first things would be so different and he'd still be around now he also gets bonus points as well for just how cool not just he looks but also his entire faction. The heretic faction looks so damn cool and he's just like the cherry on top of all of that. The elites are blind, Arbiter, but I will make them see. Next up, Jullum Dharma. I was never really a fan of Jul, to be honest with you, so I'm going to put him at the top of C tier. Um, his character in Kilo 5 was, it was alright, like, seeing why he became who he was, losing his wife and everything, added more backstory to why he was the leader of the Storm faction or the, his covenant, Jullum Dharma's covenant in Halo 4 and Spartan Ops, but I don't know, I just never really liked Jul that much. It was a bit too of a stereotypical of like an evil alien character. Didn't really have much nuance, at least in the games, which I think he was missing. I thought it would have been cool if they went like a Halo 2 Arbiter route with Jull, but <laughs> that didn't happen because he got off in the first five minutes of Halo 5, which sucks really bad. The Prophet of Mercy. Mercy, I always find quite a joke because he's just a spineless motherfucker. I'm going to put Mercy in A tier. Um, Hide the Spirit of Fire crew... Uh, right around the place is Lord, same place as Lord Hood, I'd say. Yeah, Mercy's just completely spineless. We, typical weak, spineless leader, who at the same time gets manipulated and betrayed by truth. Of course, he's shown no mercy as well, which I like. I like how all the prophets are named ironically, and he's a great example of that. Yeah, Mercy was good. He was definitely one of the lesser prophets. In fact, he was probably the lesser prophet of all of them, but I still enjoyed his presence. Seeing him be like the full-on religious zealot holy one was <laughs> often quite funny at times, to be honest with you. Halo, its divine wind will rush through the stars, 
propelling all who are worthy along the path to salvation. Utsei and Entho Sarum, the two Halo 3 co-op characters who later became fully fleshed out characters in Hunters in the Dark. Um, they both have very cool appearances now. I forget what armor Entho wears, but I think it's Utsei who wears uh, Ascetic, the Ascetic helmet, which is sick. These two are going to go into A tier around... Uh, around the bottom of A tier. Um, I really enjoyed them being like kind of the elite commanders in Hunters in the Dark. It was very cool seeing them become prominent characters. And I always loved them in Halo 3 as well, even though they were just complete background characters. I like the fact that canonically they are there with Chief and Arbiter the entire time. At least most of the time they're there. Not, I think it's all the time, but most of the time. I like that a lot. Next up, we have Quick to Adjust slash Virgil from ODST and also New Blood and Bad Blood. Sadie and Desh's best friend, which I, I like that little, that little friendship there. That's very, very cool. Uh, Virgil is going to go into B tier at the top. Virgil's intro cutscene, I just absolutely love. The fact that an engineer has combined with New Mombasa's statewide AI is a very, very cool idea. So much so that he literally gets named after the AI. And like I said, the friendship that he has with Sadie and Desha in New Blood and Bad Blood, I really enjoy as well. The two are like, they just can't be separated. The two are one package. You don't get one without the other. The Prophet of Regret, the old man that we punch in the wheelchair. Regret's gonna go in A tier as well. Uh, I'd say just a bit above Mercy because Regret had quite a lot more fleshing out in Halo Wars, obviously. Um, the fact that he was in that, I was, I really liked that. Uh, he, although he was a bit more like crazed and maniacal, maniacal? Not sure what the word is, one of the two, um, <laughs> in Halo Wars. In Halo 2, he obviously jumped the gun, went to Delta Halo early, and got himself killed because of it. I liked as well how much of a religious zealot he was alongside Mercy, but not quite as much as Mercy. Nothing can be done until my sermon is complete! Ripper Morami, the Arbiter from Halo Wars. This guy was a savage. He's gonna go at the bottom of A tier, I think. I forget what that story is called, but there's a really cool story that acts as basically a precursor to Halo Wars that shows how this elite, or how Ripper Morami, became an Arbiter. And he was basically taken out of prison by the prophets and given the role of arbiter for their mission which i i really really like i also love as well how despite wearing the exact same armor as fell he's very very clearly written to be radically different to fell as a character not respectful in any way he doesn't really care about honor just cares about killing humanity no matter what gets in his way even his own elites there's quite a few scenes in halo wars one where he just throws an elite to the side or pushes one out of the way a human ship has arrived and is closing in on the entrance port <laughs> Get the Hyrox to High Charity, intercept that human ship, and destroy it at once. A very dishonorable elite, but that's what Regret needed for his mission, so it fits. Ooh, Arthas Vadum, one of my favorite Halo characters of all time. Going in S plus tier, I would say... Ooh, this is hard. On par with... Hmm. No, that... Yeah, okay. Ranked fifth in S plus tier. I absolutely love Arthas Vadum so, so much. Him and Arbiter, I, I just want a story with him and Arbiter again so, so bad. Shadow of Intent, written by Joe Staten, was a fantastic continuation of his story after Halo 3. Seeing him hunting down the Prophets, literally hunting them to the last is, is very, very cool. And running into a Prelate as well was a very cool interaction for him. His origin story as well, how he became Half-Jaw, the fact that he fought one of the best Blade Masters in the history of the Covenant and his entire species, Barakusavai, one of his best friends, as a combat form and actually won but in the process lost two of his mandibles was such a sick origin story for what was realistically just like a small detail in his character in Halo 2 that was just put there to set him apart from the rest of the elites. What is it? That stench. I've smelled it before. Artas, Spec Ops Commander, Half Jaw, whatever the hell you want to call him. Absolutely fantastic character that I really hope comes back soon. What an incredible elite. My second favorite elite character of all time behind the one and only Arbiter. This armor suits you, but it cannot hide that mark. Nothing ever will. You are the Arbiter, the will of the Prophets. But these are my elites. Their lives matter to me. Yours does not. That makes two of us. Second to last with the Covenant, we have the one and only Tartar Source, Tartarus. Tartarus is going to go uh, mid-A tier, I would say. About... 
huge. But there. I love Tartarus. His backstory in Contact Harvest was fantastic. Seeing him usurp Maccabeus, his uncle, and take his fist of Rukt and become chief of the, of the Brutes after that was a very great ascension. It was a very brutish ascension to power that fit his character perfectly. And I love that little bit at the end of Halo 2 where you can tell that the Arbiter is almost getting through to him about the Covenant's lies. He's like, he's that close to turning him. But Tartarus is just too far gone and digs in deeper with the Covenant. Tartarus, the prophets have betrayed us. <laughs> no, Arbiter. The great journey has begun. And the brutes, not the elite, shall be the prophet's escort. I love Tartarus' character so much. Fantastic design, fantastic voice acting. I forgot the name of the guy who voice acted him. Fantastic voice acting, fantastically written character, both in his backstory and also in his in his only game, unfortunately. Yeah, love Tartarus. And finally for the Covenant, we have the Prophet of Truth, the greatest deceiver in the history of the galaxy. Truth is going to go, I would say, above Tartarus, above yeah, Truth's gonna, yeah, I mean, second in S tier, that's only right, right? I mean, he formed basically an entire religion on a lie and went through the entire thing, power tripping, and got right to the end, and unfortunately right before the end went so crazy that he started to believe his own lies. What a fantastic progression of a character. Even though he's ending in Halo 3, or not, I say that he's ending, his death in Halo 3 was perfect. His characterization in Halo 3 wasn't anywhere near as good as Halo 2, I think we can all admit that, but... I, it's a, I think it's a very plausible way for his character to go, for him to basically start to believe his own lies and go crazy based on that and also the fact that he's power tripping because he's the only one in charge of the entire Covenant at that point. But Halo 2's version of him is just absolutely perfect. Michael Wincott played him so well. Right then, on to the Banished. We have Atriox, and Atriox for me is probably a mid-S tier character. I would say just a bit lower than... Yeah, just below them, Buck and Tartarus. I love Atriox. Obviously, he's the founding father of the Banished, and the reason the Banished were formed is such a good reason to, to form a faction. For me, a lot of the Covenant Remnant factions that we'd had post Halo 3, I just didn't really care about any of them. But the Banished were the first one where I was like, right, these are believable, or not just believable, because the rest of them were believable as well, but these are like interesting, they're different, they've got a different motive, they don't believe in the Great Journey, they don't hate humanity, they hate the Covenant, but at the same time, they are technically a Covenant remnant slash... I guess a Covenant Rebellion remnant, you could say. Both Atriox's intro cutscene and intro story as well in the comics, seeing all of his brutes being sent off to die by the Covenant time after time after time again, basically being used to break the human lines and having that be the thing that changed him and made him realize that this isn't worth it, none of this is worth this much bloodshed, is such a great foundation for a character. He's also got just a fantastic, fantastic design as well. I mean, Chainbreaker, his mace is an energy mace, man. I mean, that alone is just sick. His armor with the ODST breastplate on his stomach is sick, with the power fist, like the metal fist on his left, on his left or right hand, one of the two, I forgot which one. And also the fact that he's played by John DiMaggio as well, for God's sake. I mean, the Marcus Phoenix. Marcus Phoenix plays Atriox. That alone is just a, a massive, massive derb. Nothing but a man. I can't wait to see what Atriox does with the Endless after Infinite. Hopefully we find that soon. Next up, we have Decimus, who was Atriox's second in command during the war on the Ark. Decimus was, eh, he was all right. I'd say B tier, about, about there. Um, I loved his boss fight. His, in fact, his boss fight mechanically for an RTS was fantastically designed. I really, really liked that. Um, but characterized, eh, he wasn't much in Halo Wars 2 at least. In, um, what's it called, Rise of Aatrox, the comic series, he was characterized a decent amount in that. Um, but he never became like a Tartarus level character or anything. He was always just kind of like the the brute force second in command for, for Atriox. So you had a cool mech along, alongside as well. The War Chief Esherim, the one who basically trained Atriox to become what he was. Um, Esherim was less banished and more just kind of like brute in Halo Infinite. I think he lacked a lot of the kind of humanizing aspects of the banishes of faction that Atriox have. 
Uh, he was he felt more like a like a covenant brute at times, honestly. But given the fact that Cortana had destroyed Doizak and the fact that that made the banished hate humanity, you can kind of understand it. I'm gonna put Eshram in A tier. I'd say just above the Spirit of Fire crew. I did like Eshram quite a lot, but the more that I've replayed Infinite's campaign, I've come to realize that he's not the most interesting of all the banished in that game. Um, he's a cool leader, don't get me wrong. It's cool that he trained, uh, trained Atriox, and it's very cool that he's got those really weird like metal plates on his armor. Almost like Japanese style. I don't know what kind of like aesthetic that's from, but it looks kind of Japanese to me. Uh, I like his armor, but his character was kind of just like brute that hates humanity, which has been done before with Tartarus, obviously, and he wasn't as deep as Tartarus. Next up, Jaeger, my favorite enemy character in all of Halo Infinite. In fact, probably my favorite character in Halo Infinite, to be honest with you. Jaeger is going to go in S tier. <laughs> Would it surprise you that I like him as much as Emil? Would, you, would that surprise you? I feel like Jaeger is kind of like the elite version of Emil. Very like black and red design with like edgy design. He loves blades and knives and stuff and killing and is very like dark and broody. I really like that. He's also very interesting as well because Jaeger is an elite who doesn't care about honor, just cares about killing things. Also an elite that cares so little about honor that he has a prosthetic arm. He's from a culture that didn't believe in hospitals until like a few years back and he has a prosthetic arm with an energy short sword built into it, which is so, so sick. Visually, he's oh, visually incredible. And also as well, his VA, Noshir Dalal, did such a damn good job at making him seem like this pure evil elite. Some of Jaeger's concept art as well, one of which had him wearing some Arbiter armor is really, really sick. But it's one of those things where like, I don't feel like it's a grass is always greener situation because yes, all of his concept art looked absolutely sick, but the armor that we got in game also looked absolutely sick. So it's kind of like a win-win scenario, right? Uh, Jaeger, I do wish didn't die in Infinite, but his boss fight theming was really, really, really good. Uh, if, he, if we got more of him in Infinite, I'd maybe put him S plus tier. Just more of his existing character because I, I loved it so much. I also loved as well that he was one of the survivors surviving members of that, that party of Silent Shadow that hunted Roland and Jonah in Headhunters from Evolutions. That was very sick as well. But yeah, the whole theming of his character, the first Silent Shadow member to ever be in a game that, for me, I've always loved the Silent Shadow, so that holds a special place for me. I loved, loved, loved Jaeger. Absolutely loved him. Let Valir. Now, I'm going to be honest, I haven't actually read uh, Divine Wind yet, so I don't know the ins and outs of what happens with him on the arc after Halo Wars 2. But I remember loving his design and his voice work. It's just he was barely in Halo Wars 2. So for me, I'm going to put Let in B tier. Probably like, uh, yeah, underneath underneath Virgil. About there, I'd say. Not really much to say about Let, to be honest with you. Um, I know he's the commander of all the banished forces on the Ark now. Uh, but in Halo Wars 2, he had like literally one line, which kind of sucked. Because I thought that his almost counselor-inspired headdress was so sick and I would have loved to have seen more of that on screen in Blur Cinematics. Next up, we have one of the two banished brothers from Awaken the Nightmare. First off, Pavium. Pavium is gonna go at the mm, top of B tier. I think they're both gonna go about the same level, honestly. Um, again, I know they're both in Divine Wind, but I haven't read Divine Wind yet, so I can't fully judge them, but I love them in Awaken the Nightmare. I love how they made, they went out of the way to write them both to be very unique characters. You've got Pavium, who's the really, really heavy brute trooper with the riot shield and the like wrist mounted grenade launcher. That's so sick. The more cautious of the two as well, the one that didn't want to go against Atriox's word and that knew Voridus was going to regardless. These two have got a great dynamic. You know what, in fact, whilst but whilst we're at it, let's just stick uh, Voridus there as well. I probably should have put these two together, like Utse and Nenetho, because they go together. Um, Voridus, I love his design as well with the wrist bleed. Oh, I'll never forget when I first saw that cutscene where the Flood come out of High Charity and he fights them with that gas mask and wrist bleed. Such a sick cutscene. These two characters are really, really cool. And my my hope is that my fingers are crossed that at some point they make their way to Zeta Halo and we get to see him in an FPS game. Imagine these two as boss fights. 
Pavian with his riot shield and wrist mounted grenade launcher, and Voridus with his like full stealth armor kind of thing and wrist bleed. Like, that's so sick. I'd love to see that in a game at some point. And if by some insane stretch of the imagination this did ever happen, I'd love to see Voridus use his scythe that he has in a piece of concept art. Obviously, he didn't have this in game, but. Oh my god, this concept art, a brute with a scythe, is so, so sick. That's such a cool weapon that I would love to have him use in a boss fight or something. Imagine fighting a fully armoured brute with a scythe. Do I need to say anything else? I think I can just leave that one there. But they've not been fleshed out enough for me yet in the games to really rank them any higher than B tier. But, like I said with Locke earlier, there's a lot of potential. Right then, moving on to the foreigner section, we have 343 Guilty Spark, who I feel like, after all this personification over the years, just has to go into S plus tier. I mean, not only was he iconic in the original trilogy, how he was our friend, then betrayed us, then was our friend again, then betrayed us again. He was a great character, um, one of the absolute hallmarks of the original Bungie trilogy, without a shadow of a doubt. Tim Dadabo's voice work on him was just so damn memorable. But then you've got the kind of second and third era, or rather I should say first and third era of Spark as well, when he was a human, Chakas, that entire story during the Fauna trilogy was fantastic. And then you've also got like Point of Light and the whole Ryan Forge sections of his third era, where he becomes Chakas again, mostly. I'm still not a fan of him really surviving Halo 3, but I will say the way they've characterized him and written him after that, even though I don't like that, the way they've characterized and written him has been pretty good, so I can't judge that too harshly. Um, and now he's off in a different galaxy with a librarian reseeding the precursors, which is quite wild to think, so Spark is definitely S plus tier. You know who else is S plus tier? The Didact. The Didact I absolutely adore. When we first got him in the Halo 3 terminal, people forget that the Didact was technically a Bungie character at first. He wasn't a 343 character. I mean, obviously he's a mainly 343 character, but Bungie were the first ones to introduce him. And ever since those terminals in Halo 3, I'd wanted to know more, which is why I was so happy with Halo 4's story that he was the main antagonist. His backstory as well, the vicious rivalry that he had with the person we're gonna be looking at next uh, in regards to the Halos, and also the ways that he tried to fight the Flood during the the Fauna Flood War, building the Prometheans as these like non-organic beings that were meant to purely counter them, but they weren't effective enough, so he went crazy trying to make more of them to overpower them. Such a great story in the Fauna Trilogy. And then of course in Halo 4 as well, even though we only get like semi-logic plague didact in that game, he's still really good. I'm still pissed off beyond belief that they killed him off in Halo Escalation, specifically in a way that they said that he couldn't be killed. In I think it was Silentium or Primordium says that, but he still gets killed via a composer, which is just stupid. I'm not one for retconning stories at all. However, I would be so, so, so down for in the future, the next 72 hours of Escalation just getting completely retconned. Black Team never died, the Didact never died, etc., etc., because that story arc was awful and it, it just damaged so much of Halo's story. So many cool elements of Halo's story were just wiped off the board because of that. Granted, the Didact is out there. I'm pretty sure he's supposed to be in the domain as an AI, but... I don't want that, man. Bring bring him back in his armor as like a sentient foreigner, like an organic foreigner, not just an AI, because we've had so many AIs like that now, we don't need any more. Bring him back as an organic foreigner. Oh, man, dude, I want to see Chief and the Didact team up with the Prometheans, friendly, against the Flood so, so bad. That's like my dream Halo story scenario for the future. Fingers crossed it happens, but the Didact for me is absolutely an S plus tier character. And next up, we have Fieber, the Master Builder, who I'm going to put in A tier. Eh, just anywhere in A tier, really, I guess there. He could kind of go anywhere in A tier. He was the Didact's number one rival during the time of the Forerunners. Obviously, he was the creator of all the Halos in the first place. He's the reason the Halos are created, so he's got to get ranking points for that alone, right? Like, surely. Uh, he was the one that wanted to use the Halos, and obviously the Didact didn't because he didn't believe in them. He thought they were ethically questionable to say the least, um, but Faber's descent into like pure evilness and madness on the Zeta Hilo in the Palace of Pain with Mendic and Bias and with the Primordial was such good writing. That's some of my favorite Halo story of all time right there from Primordium. The stuff that he did to the ancient humans on that ring, the torturous stuff that he did to them was just horrific, um, but I thought Faber was a, a really, really damn good character. And so was the Isodidact, Born Stella, who is also going to go into S tier, 
I don't know where. Where's he gonna go? I would say... Uh, he's about on par with Lasky, I'd say. Let's, let's stick him there. The Isodidact Born Stella is one of the most important characters of the entire Fauna era of the galaxy. For years, there was that fan theory that Chief had the Isodidact Gaish in him and was like the reincarnated version of the Isodidact. It's never been fully, like, debunked, but at the same time, it's probably not the case. But yeah, the Isodidact slash Born Stellar basically filled in for the Didact towards the end of the war and was the leader of most of the Foreigners' forces against the Flood. He was a hero. He ensured that the, <laughs> that the Flood didn't win and consume everything. If it weren't for him, then we'd be speaking Flood right now. And I like how after the war as well, once he'd gone back and restarted the domain with Chanter Green and all those, he basically went to live out in exile and just like, not exile, exile is the wrong term. He went to go live out in peace and kind of try and shed the isodidact part of his personality that he'd gained during the war and go back to being born Stella, who he was before, the foreigner manipular and less the, the foreigner war commander of the didact. The foreigner trilogy as well is essentially his story. Um, the whole thing revolves around him. It starts with him. It goes through with him and it ends with him. Starts with him getting the, the didact out of his cryptum and dodging all the war sphinxes and it ends with him firing the array and then going off to live a, a quiet life with his wife, which is pretty admirable. But yeah, just an incredibly well-written character with so many important ramifications for the universe. Like I said, if it weren't for the isodidact, considering he was the one that fired the halo array at the end of the war, we would all be speaking Flood right now. Next up, the librarian. The librarian is going to go towards top of A tier. Uh, yeah, I'd say about there, on par, a little bit higher than Faber. If the Isodidact is the reason we're not speaking Flood right now, the Librarian is the reason that we're speaking right now. If it weren't for her conservation measure, then we would all be dead. I love the fact as well that she died at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. She stayed on Earth after doing the, the conservation measure. She realized that she wasn't going to be able to make it back into space in time and she just died on Earth. I also feel like she was also a kind of humanizing, empathetical anchor for the didact as well, considering she was his wife. Yeah, the librarian is a very important character who was portrayed, I think, in Halo 4. She was portrayed really well, but it just sucks that her cutscene is like the massive info dump. I feel like if it wasn't that huge Deus Ex Machina, then it would be, I think she'd be received a lot better. But in the Expanded Universe, the librarian is a fantastic character who, like I said, is the sole reason that all humanity and all the other species that are alive right now are alive. If it if it weren't for her, then we wouldn't even be here right now. Ho oh, ho, next up we have the one and only Mendicant Bias. It's so hard, man, because I love Johnson and I love Arbiter. Uh, I feel like these three are like my holy trinity of Halo characters. They're all very close. Um, Mendicant is going to go third in S plus tier. One of the coolest, darkest, most enigmatic, mysterious, coolest characters in the whole franchise that I seriously hope at some point we get more on because man, man, the history of this character going from leading the entire foreigner war effort against the Flood to defecting to the Flood to then realizing at the end of the war when it was defeated the error of its ways and trying to help humanity to in turn indirectly help the foreigners because they believed that humanity were the holders of the mantle or at least the librarian did, trying to trying to guide humanity towards the mantle and make sure the flood didn't win, betraying its former masters. So good. That terminal on Halo 3, on Halo, on Legendary, the Mendicant Bias terminal is one of the coolest bits of storytelling in the entire franchise. Full stop. The fact as well that the tower that Citadel and Epitaph are in essentially acts as his tombstone, as his headstone in the vast desert that he's buried beneath on the Ark after his trial is again just beautiful, beautiful environmental storytelling. As you all know, I could talk for weeks upon weeks and end about how good of a character Mendicon Bias is, but I'll leave it there. Needless to say, he is S plus tier. And next we have Offensive Bias. Now I guarantee in say a few years time if I was doing this, he'd be S plus tier near the top with Mendicon Bias. But I can't rank him that high yet because he's not really got much lore to be honest with you yet. Obviously, we know that that's not going to be the case for much longer, which is so, so fucking exciting. But for now, I'm going to put him right at the top of A tier. I'd love, I really want to rank him higher, 
but I need to be reasonable because, like I said, he's not got much law so far. All we really know so far is that obviously he was designed in the final hours of the war to be the direct counter to Mendicant Bias, the last thing that could stop Mendicant Bias, and he goes to win a battle against him when he's like, he's outnumbered like, what is it? That's it. 436.6 to 1 in the final battle of the arc against Mendicant's Flood Fleet, and yet he buys the foreigners, I said that in particular, enough time to fire the array is absolutely insane. And then after the war, the fact that he was charged with overseeing the burial site of the Endless was so sick. And the fact as well, I've got to say it, the fact that his form is the Halo 3 Guardian Sentinel is just... Infinite chef kisses. Infinite, infinite chef kisses. I can't, I can't give that design enough chef kisses. The fact that that design is not only back, but it's offensive motherfucking bias is just so perfect. I cannot wait to see his character get fleshed out more in future games. Oh my god. The thought that offensive bias may well be an ally in the next part of the story against the Endless. Please hurry up and make that story through 4 3. Please hurry up with it. I need that so bad. And then finally, we have the Warden Eternal, who's going to go at the bottom of C tier. I wouldn't say D tier, because I think his design is pretty cool, and his voice is really, really cool. I'm not sure who his voice actor is, but the voice for the Warden was really sick. You all in the name of what, Cortana? Warden, don't. And his design overall was cool, having a hard light sword was sick. Um, but his character in Halo 5 is just kind of like... I don't know, just a barrier, really. I don't really have many thoughts about him. He's the Keeper of the Domain, which I guess is kind of cool, but that part of his character is never really fleshed out that much. Besides in that one story from Halo, I think it's Tales from Slip Space, uh, where Cortana gets into the Domain. That's really the only story that kind of fleshes it out, and even then it doesn't do it much. Um, so yeah, the Warden is kind of, eh, I'm not really that bothered, to be honest with you. <laughs> Jesus Christ, my biomass is melting in this heat, which means it's the perfect time to move on to the Flood. There are only really two Flood characters. There's firstly, of course, the Gravemind, who is going to go into S plus tier. Um, nah, I'd say, I'd say there. The Gravemind's introduction in Halo 2 is one of the best Halo cutscenes of all time. Back in the day, it was such a surprise seeing that. And honestly, even though it's not a surprise anymore, the kind of weight and gravity of not just seeing the Gravemind for the first time, but also the information that he's delivering is still so impactful nowadays. Your prophets have promised you freedom from a doomed existence, but you will find no salvation on this ring. Those who built this place knew what they wrought. Do not mistake their intent, or all will perish as they did before. It's such a shame that we only saw him once during the original trilogy, um, but his personality was written so damn well. I mean, Joe's stating, right? Joe is just a god of writing characters, and the Grave Mind is another fantastic example. The fact that he speaks in, is it iambic heptameter or iambic pentameter, one of the two? Basically, he speaks in rhyme is really, really clever. That's such a cool way to write a character, especially one like of this kind of level of weirdness, right? Essentially a zombie Venus flytrap. And then, kind of on the same note, we have the one and only Primordial, who is gonna go... Um, exactly the same as the Grave Mind. Those two are like one and the same in terms of their rankings. The Primordial is such a cool, mysterious character that's so damn creepy. I mean, the fact that he managed to get all those ancient humans to commit suicide by just speaking to them, that alone is like insane. That <laughs> is horrifying. The fact as well that he's the final precursor is a major, major deal, or rather was the final precursor. And that he revealed that the precursors became the Flood purely to spite and get back at the Foreigners is such a cool twist in the Foreigner trilogy. And the fact that he's the one to deliver that information in such a creepy manner is so sick. The running theory right now that of all places, the Silent Auditorium is actually where he was put in that time capsule and killed that just makes the Silent Auditorium even cooler. I think, I have a feeling that theory is going to be correct because the design of that kind of massive antechamber kind of room is similar to the description of the time capsule that they put him in in the Fallen Trilogy. So that just adds even more like love to that area for me. But yeah, the Primordial's character 
was pure eldritch horror diluted down into one character. Fantastically written by Greg Bear, has left so many ramifications throughout the rest of the franchise still, and is a character that I would love to get more of at some point. I don't know how the hell we'd ever get that, but I just, I love his style of character so much and there's nothing that will ever come close to him again. And finally, possibly on the same note as that, I've put the Harbinger into the Endless category, but for all we know, she could technically be in the Precursor category. Maybe. Fingers crossed in the future we find out, but the Harbinger for now, gonna go in A tier. Uh, okay, let's reorder these a little bit. She's gonna go in between Faber and the Librarian in A tier. I'd like to put her higher, but... She didn't get much fleshing out in Infinite, which was the point, to be fair, because obviously she's a member of the Endless, and the Endless are really mysterious, and we're not meant to know much about them. Um, my only downside to her, well, major downside to her in Infinite is that she died. I kind of wish she didn't die, honestly. I think that she should have lived. I would have liked it if maybe she teleports away or something at the end of a boss fight and she gets away. Like, I don't think Infinite needed to have us kill another boss at the end. And I, I feel like it would have been beneficial to have her be present when the Endless are freed. Because that's the entire backbone of her character. She was freed so that the Endless could be freed. And although... Yeah, she's successful and her whole life goal of freeing the Endless from the persecution they received from the foreigners was she was successful in it. I just feel like it would have been a lot more impactful if she was there when the Endless are freed, but she's not going to be. I really enjoyed a boss fight on a mechanical note. Uh, I thought it was a really fun encounter, to be honest with you. Obviously, the real boss fight wasn't the Harbinger. It was that chieftain at the end. But the overall encounter, I really enjoyed. I don't love her, like, design physically, but I do like her armor, the shape of it, the color of it, and also the reclaimer symbol in a helmet. That has got to mean something. I'm adamant that it's got to mean something. I really, really hope that at some point they confirm her links to the precursors in some way because i feel like they've got to be connected in some way like she even looks kind of precursor i feel like that's got to have been done intentionally to a degree i thought her voice acting was really good deborah wilson did a damn good job playing her i really really liked her voice she felt really imposing and powerful and hear this forerunners your auditorium has fallen the endless battle your sins undone Today we return! <laughs> Funnily enough, like how in um, Rubicon Protocol it said that whenever she speaks it feels like you get this really unsettling feeling like spiders crawling all over you or something. I kind of got that from her in game which is really good. She feels like she's a member of this very mysterious and really intelligent species that, uh, that have just been unleashed and we don't understand at all, which I'm looking forward to seeing more of. Um, well, with her species. Obviously not with her because she's dead, but yeah. Harbinger goes into A tier. I really enjoyed her, but I wish that she hadn't died, and I wish that we could have got more of her because I felt like her character hadn't reached its fullest potential yet. And so I'm going to round this one out here because I'm melting right now. I'm not sure if you can see. There is my Halo character tier list. Let me know what you think of the rankings. Um, there's actually nothing in D tier, I just realized. Not too surprised, to be honest with you. But of course, don't forget to do your own version of this tier list. The link to it is in the description. And let me know what your rankings are. So, with that said, let's definitely round this one out here so I can go and have a freezing cold shower. My god, I'm melting. I want to give a massive thank you to all of my amazing patrons for the support over there. As per usual, thank you so much. And thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll catch you all in the next one.